and a beautiful day and, and, and to listen to this seminar. Um, I'll give a brief introduction, not take too much time because we want to hear a lot about what Peter's research is about. Peter first showed up on our radar screen because it was this guy with MD after his name who started sending emails because he wanted to know more about the details of interpolation. And I don't get emails from doctors too often who want to know about the details of interpolation. And, and, and then we discovered that he was downloading Ski Run and starting to use Ski Run software. And, and needed a little help with that. And so, so with that email contact, we managed to meet, hook up last spring for the first time, meet in person in Prague, and, uh, and discovered a lot of similarity. And it turns out that, that uh, Peter is, doesn't show it here, but he's actually a PhD and an MD. And he did his PhD at the same place that I did in, in, in Canada. And, uh, and so, so he has this kind of great training, both in, in the real, world, real clinical world of cardiology and the real simulation world. Of, uh, of, of research and, and, and the kind of simulation and electrophysiology theory and mathematics that came out of this lab in Halifax. And so he's, so he's you know, sort of uniquely qualified to, to work with us and, and do some of the things he's going to tell you about today. So he really is a, a special individual. And we're incredibly happy to have him spend some time with us. He's been here for the past week, and a lot of you have met with him. We've had some great interactions. And they really, I think, are a starting point for collaborations that we see moving forward that we're very excited about. So we've asked Peter to give kind of an overview of, of his research, where it comes from, you know, what the medical motivation is, certainly something about the, the technical aspects of it as he sees them. And, and, and like I say, to give all of you a sense of what's exciting about this research and why, uh, although some of these topics are very old, I think one of his first slides is, you know, it's going to be like a 100-year-old picture of ECG, but why these topics are, are back again today and why they're relevant today, not just from a geeky technical perspective, because we all think they're very cool, but actually from a clinical perspective. So what's changed in the clinical world that makes some of this research more relevant than it was even a few years ago. So, no further ado, I'll ask Peter to tell us more about it. Thanks, Rob, very much for this. Uh, for and two nice uh, introduction of my person. Uh, nevertheless, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and, and for the chance to share with you some of my views. Actually, to make it more accurate, I finished my uh, PhD back in Prague, but most of the data come from, from Halifax, uh, from work with uh, Milan Horacek, whom you, many of, of you may know. Uh, the actual first motivation for conducting uh, ski was uh, when I was working on, on the PhD defense, I did interpolation of our data from Prague by means of MAP3D software, and that's where we first exchanged some messages, so it's already four years ago, doesn't matter. Okay, so to, to put you a little bit into the context of uh, ECG mapping, what it is, what is the relevance to the clinical electrocardiography, is that this, these pioneers of ECG, they basically had those ideas about electrical fields in their minds, but they could not uh, map, of course, because they were using buckets of saline uh, instead, of, uh, instead of electrodes, like Willem and uh, So ECG mapping occurred first in the 50s, actually the first uh, paper comes from Nehan, but uh, you all know this uh, laboratory and this work uh, very intimately. And what happened to the clinical ECG in between that let's say centennial of EKG because it's about five years ago that we celebrated actually the centennial of EKG. And this very moment was a development of 12 e ECG that, that we use up today. So how it happens, we've got uh, more than 60 years of mapping ECG potentials. We still use 12 e ECG that was invented by Wilson in the 40s during the war times. And I believe this is why. It's a very practical question. Well, Takati could have seen many of the features that, that you can't appreciate on, on 12 EKG uh, because he noticed that, that the distribution of the potential is somehow different from the ideal dipolar smooth distribution. Nevertheless, is it worthwhile to go for it in a clinical situation? Is it not? But there are some other moments that tells you uh, that tell you what uh, what what kind of 
modality, what kind of type of display you use. So 12-ECG up until now is considered a standard. Uh, regardless, it was introduced in analog era. It's simple, affordable, standardized. You can see both spatial and, and time domain at the same time on a single A4 or letter paper. You evaluate just chess reads that uh, Eindhoven or those pioneers did not have a chance to record. And actually, our evaluation of chess reads very much resembles some of the, some of the uh, algorithms that, that we use in, in voice surface maps. Well, VDCG, even though it's a standard, it's, it's mandatory, every doctor has to learn it, they still have difficulties with it. Even when I ask my students what is the most difficult from cardiology lessons, what they go to review, what they need to, to emphasize or, or reinforce, they always say that ECG is, is, is the biggest pain, much more than, than cardiac imaging or whatever other diagnostic method or, or treatment algorithms. At the same time, 12 ECG serves as a paradigm for life-saving measures. So no nowadays, we teach emergency workers, firefighters, or ambulance healthcare workers how to refer patients with the 12 ECG to the, to the hospital, and we base a treatment upon it. So it's a very simple template that everyone can acquire, not even being a doctor, and being a health professional of a different of a different level. At the same time, by just mere look at the, at the analog signals, you can immediately see whether your patient is in normal rhythm, sinus rhythm, or whether he or she is in, in severe arrhythmia, like ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation. And you see it just by, by one look at a simple paper recording or a simple snapshot from a, uh, from a computer screen. So how is, this, how is this result translated into the clinical practice? Actually, we have algorithms that decide about your life or death like emergency revascular, revascularization procedures based upon 12 EKG. There would be no electro, cardiac electrophysiology in this hospital if there were no EKG. You cannot do clinical cardiac electrophysiology based only upon the cardiac imaging or, or some other techniques than ECG. Basically, no cardiology exam exists nowadays without EKG. And EKG is recommended for many clinical situations. So if you hear anyone to tell you that ECG is an uh, obsolete technique, that cardiac imaging is taking over, it's bluntly not true. And EKG will be around, I believe, for another 100 years. When you compare analog or let's say let's say it's nowadays digitized so it's not analog but let's say scalar EKG tracing and body surface mapping or ECG mapping. Again I remind you that by just looking at the 12 EKG in a simple format you can not only appreciate activity from atria ventricles, you see P wave, you see QRS complex, you can measure intervals very simple tools. You can distinguish noise from, from the signal of interest immediately by just having at least some experience with uh, ECG. If you were to expand this, uh, this tracing to body surface map, you would, you would get about 10 times or maybe 100 times more maps than, than on the right side of this paper depending on the sample frequency that you will take. 
I assume you all understand the sampling and, and, and the difference between mapping and between, between the scale of tracing and the working regime. So it's, uh, it makes sense. So that would be a plenty of information to review. Of course, we can do some sort of compression. We can animate EKG maps and make a dynamic picture of uh, EKG tracing. This is just 20 milliseconds what you what you observed of the QRS complex. So first, before you look at those maps, you have to know it is a QRS complex, but it is not a Q T wave or T wave. So regardless of having those maps, you, you still have to look at the scale of tracing before you start to analyze uh, body surface maps. And basically, you cannot even construct them before you analyze the scale of tracing and before you set your P wave onset offset QRS of P wave and so on and so forth. If I were to expand this uh, animation on the full scale of that uh, trace of that scalar EKG tracing and, and would like to present it to you in some reasonable time, you would get very jittered, crowded animation of events that are so numerous and so chaotic, it looks like boiling soup, that you would basically uh, become completely lost in those maps. So, so you need to employ some sort of uh, sophisticated algorithms to get some information from the And that's what that is what contributes to the to the downside of the EKG mapping. And in my opinion this is the very reason why it could never beat uh, the scalar EKG tracing, regardless of all the analysis that I will show you further. further. Yes, of course, go ahead with any questions if you could just for a halter for Seven days. Yes. Let alone. Is yeah. here. Let alone ambulatory EKG monitoring, of course, that can last for 24 hours. For 24 hours is standard. Seven days halter is a, is a modern development of halter monitoring for patients who usually undergo some procedures and where we, where we need extended data uh, to analyze and, and observe. So these are the cons of EKG mapping. We have no standardization for EKG mapping, for example, up, up until now. There is some cost of technology, which I don't mean only money. I mean just time to process and the resources, computer resources you need for it. It's difficult to ev evaluate. And basically you need at least these three basic algorithms, like pattern recognition, statistical imaging, by statistical imaging I mean statistical analysis transformed some way into the, into the graphical representations, and you need very often advanced mathematical methods. So my question for today, the principal one, whether computer modeling can, can change this, and can some way, the EKG mapping introduced into the uh, clinical practice. And why would we do it? Because we all know that EKG mapping contains much more information than scalar EKG tracing. By the word much more, I mean something that's uh, not really tangible. Actually, my opinion nowadays that uh, if I went through all the clinical symptoms or clinical entities that I had the opportunity to analyze with EKG mapping, I would say it would add about 10% of sensitivity while not sacrificing specificity. But that did not include computer modeling and for example inverse EKG solutions that, uh, that are in my opinion a completely different story. So what are the pros and what makes me biased still after 20 years of, of exposition to EKG mapping? Okay, there is more information, there's no doubt about it. 
we, we at least have much better spatial domain representation. We can understand the electrical field more. It is optimal for experimental and laboratory work, and I will show you some of the results we got. Uh, it is very good for measuring error performance, for example, of, of suggested diagnostic criteria, criteria from EKG. You can, you can very well evaluate problems with leak placement, and of course you can do computer modeling. So these are just a few examples. We are, for example, at, uh, observing coronary spasm spasm of coronary artery that, that block perfusion for a while and create transient ischemia. It's very easy to appreciate on 12 EPCG in the ST segment. You can see elevations or depressions. So we were observing whether we can see something in the QRS complex as well. Whether, whether transient ischemia affects conduction, and it does. And this is, this is how, how it does. So you can see how the, for example, Q wave extends during the, uh, during the ischemia and then subsides after the relief of the, of the coronary spasm. So to appreciate this on 12 EKG is, is more difficult. It's meant, it, it went to, to conviction of many clinicians that uh, ischemia did not actually create, was not capable of creating Q waves even transient, and we know it is not true. We could do a sophisticated analysis of, uh, we call it spatial and, and uh, time and spatial scanning of QRS complex. Uh, we did a so-called departure technique when, when we tried to identify loss of potential in the electrical field during QRS complex in myocardial infarctions that were proven by other imaging techniques, by clinical cores, and uh, that were not directly well observable on, on the scale of tracing. Yes? Uh, can you refer to the IPPC analysis of this? No, this is just plain analysis in the, in the uh, <coughs> ordinary frequency range that the 12 EPG gets, uh, gets processed. So those uh, maps actually showed us loss of potentials that were statistically significant toward, uh, toward healthy individual groups uh, and were spatially in the space correlating very well with, uh, with what we found from imaging techniques. And actually this, uh, this was confirmed uh, quite a few years later by by a group that published the same technique in circulation. What I was doing with Milan project in, in Halifax was uh, evaluating a, a performance of a suggesting di diagnostic criterion called QT dispersion. There has been quite an upheaval about whether we can measure so-called repolarization dispersion, which is a real phenomenon, observable and measurable, Within uh, ventricular myocardium as a arrhythmogenic condition, and the suggestion was that you can measure QT interval in, in various leads across the body surface, evaluate its difference, and that this difference between the longest and shortest QT interval will reflect uh, the uh, uh, dispersion of repolarization. We actually measured about uh, 30,000. QT measurements and came with a conclusion that you actually cannot prove that this is a usable, useful uh, criterion. The, uh, the difference between various groups of patients would, would have to exceed at least 50 milliseconds uh, to conclude this is, this is a real phenomenon at all, that this is not a measurement error. And actually, most of those studies published up, up to those days uh, were reporting statistical differences that were, that were smaller than this 50 millisecond 
margin. And what we also proved <coughs> that the only leads that, that could actually detect QT dispersion with a measurement error less than 10% was the entire lead set of the view body surface potential maps of the, of the EKG mapping. The, any other reduced lead system uh, demonstrated uh, errors that were really uh, unacceptable high. We also evaluated the spatial distribution of the QT level, but I think this is uh, rather beyond the scope of uh, today's talk, so I will not, I will skip that uh, information. I think uh, what's, uh, what's more important that we could uh, play with, uh, with those reduced or let's say uh, let's say clinically more practical lead sets and uh, came to a conclusion that it is possible actually to transform between uh, the full uh, ECG mapping matrix and between for example the 12 lead EKG with quite acceptable uh, accuracy however the, the diagnosis that you seek for has to be a proven EKG uh, diagnosis like for example Q-wave myocardial infarction or ST elevation or some other uh, well pronounced uh, change in, in the, in the field. So how about that uh, computer modeling? What, what, can be, what can we do about it? You all know that uh, starting about half of 90s or end of end of 90s uh, in 20th century uh, there, there was a term coined ECG imaging. I like that term. It is uh, clinically relevant in terms of in terms of bringing the electrical information from the body surface onto the heart muscle, either on the heart surfaces or into the into the muscle itself. It means basically imaging of realistic electroanatomical relations. It's using non-invasive ECG mapping as an input uh, for, the, for the processing. It's using inverse electrocardiography as a mathematical method uh, of deriving the, uh, the myocardial uh, potentials or epicardial or endocardial potentials and it's using anatomical framework applied to cardiac imaging techniques. Everything looks very optimistic. The, the, the publications from starting from 2000 basically try to tackle the uh, real clinical situation. So if we really were this successful as this group and could have, for example, distinguished even arrhythmogenic mechanisms of arrhythmia that we, that we observe in a particular patient, things would be, would be uh, really, uh, really great. But there are great questions regarding the, uh, the electrocardiographic imaging. What you saw in the previous picture was kind of in implication that uh, the best way is to go through activation times, through mapping of activation times. Uh, which might be desirable, but, but there are different ways of approaching ECG imaging. We can reconstruct potentials, we can reconstruct those activation sequences, we can use various algorithms like boundary element method, finite element method, we can use techniques that basically try to avoid meshing and discretization previous modalities and there are of course questions how these uh, types of solution affect the expected performance of the technology. There are other questions. Uh, are we supposed to create uh, patient specific individualized models or, or should we do some standardization? We, are, we have challenges of spatial registration, as I will show you, segmentation of cardiac images, things that you all know much better than I. Uh, and there is an ultimate issue of validation and verification, and I'm putting a statement 
statement into the last line of this slide that perhaps radio frequency ablation would serve as a as one of the validation and verification methods. So how how shall we solve this whole convolute or bunch of of quite a disparate uh, questions and, and, and problems regarding ECG imaging. I would suggest look at what, what's happening again in the clinical settings, what's happening in cardiac electrophysiology. Let's let's deal with something that, that's directly related to the electrical information and let's look how people who deal with cardiac potentials directly uh, in their patients so this is the daily bread of clinical cardiac electrophysiology. He takes a catheter, introduces into the vessels, usually into veins, less frequently into the arteries, and has the comfort to observe activation sequence through, for example, multipolar catheters, like in this case, and can directly derive a diagnosis for example, typical atrial flutter that, that rotates within the right atrium. And just by deploying a single multipolar catheter, you can see the uh, activation sequence within the right atrium. And if your diagnosis is right, and start to ablate at a particular place that you know is vulnerable in, in that type of arrhythmia, you just confirm the mechanism. So this is a successful radio frequency ablation of an arrhythmia that uses so-called so-called cavotricuspid isthmus in within the right atrium as a critical part of the circuit that's amenable to the termination of arrhythmia. So what is this clinical cardiac electrophysiology? Then compass is intracardiac mapping. Nowadays is using more than 10 years already. When I first saw carpal system, it's been still introduced on Unix system in 1998. So it's more than 10 years, it's already 12 years. There, there was this term introduced of electroanatomical mapping. So what is the difference between ECG imaging and electroanatomical mapping? Basically nothing. It's the same thing achieved through the invasive measurements. So I think we are pretty close to what we want. Originally it was done by point-to-point -point mapping, but we need to stay up to date. We want to, to derive something useful from the ECG imaging. We have to be really up to date and know what's happening in the uh, EP laboratories. Nowadays, there have been recently introduced so-called fast mapping algorithms and simultaneous catheter tracking visualization. Radiation exposure from the X-ray that you saw on the previous pictures decreased by a factor of at least 50%. And also, clinical cardiac electrophysiology brought in the last 20 to 30 years, a huge advancement of 12 EKG analysis. So the way we treat 12 EKG today and the way we treated it in 1970s is, is much different. So the ECG imaging has to match all this. What's the most important and what, what, what no laboratory technique can beat is that actually physicians understand so-called arrhythmia syndromes. So a physician basically evaluates the patient not only through the, through the technology, but also through the patient history and through many other relevant uh, tasks. So, so we know that, that arrhythmias bring always syndromes with them. So it's, it's not only EKG that decides what type of arrhythmia you have. 
So how does the electroanatomical mapping look like? I think most of you know this is this is the typical classical picture of right atrium uh, acquired through the point-to-point -point mapping. This is the other modality of let's say electroanatomical mapping, so called non-contact mapping that that you can achieve through an intracardiac probe, which is fairly invasive but quite accurate and able to reconstruct the endocardial potentials. And it's, it's the only technology that uses actually inverse solution in the, in the real in the real world in, the, in terms of uh, in terms of arrhythmia in terms of medicine. And this is one of the newest systems that uh, acquire uh, routinely cardiac images from, from uh, computer tomography or magnetic resonance. It's called Navex. It's a product of uh, St. Jude Medical and it allows to, to track catheters uh, already with multiple holes and you can even, even display the shape of the catheter quite accurately on the basis of uh, impedance tracking. So basically we, we, we know what we want from ECG imaging. We want something that, that is better than these modalities, that is perhaps faster, stable, it's, and you can provide it to the patient either during the, the cardiac procedure or, or uh, based your assessment patient before he or she comes to the laboratory. So we, we said, okay, let's try some real arrhythmia. And let's try to ECG imaging in, in some real case. RVOT is an arrhythmia coming from the uh, from so-called outflow tract of the right ventricle. It's, it's pretty common. The reason why we chose it was because it's usually easy to apply, so we, we had at least some degree of certainty that the patient will go out from the laboratory ablated and we would know where the ablation would happen. And we can recognize that the arrhythmia comes from, from the outflow tract on the basis of analysis of 12 inch ECG even before uh, he or she comes to the laboratory. So this is the way you, you do the ablation by combination of, of x-ray and carto mapping. So the patient had successful ablation. This is another nice feature uh, of the of this particular type of arrhythmia. They are nowadays called outflow tract tachycardias, and we know that they can come also from the left ventricle outflow tract because these outflows are like cubes that touch each other. And actually, it's very desirable to know before whether the arrhythmia is more likely to come from the right outflow or left outflow because that means that whether you should enter uh, veins or arteries for the procedure. So what type of ECG imaging we, we, uh, we try to use? We basically copied the approach of, of, of Rudy who published uh, in Nature Medicine in 2004 his boundary element method based ECG imaging. We, we just had to differ at, at certain points. We have just different type of electrode settings. We do, we do not have the vest. We have a different uh, uh, op options of, of getting uh, geometry since we use computer tomography, we cannot, for example, acquire the entire uh, torso. So we, we only had uh, an option to, to, to get the cardiac geometry. Uh, we we use just different software, and, and, and this is the reason why I'm here, because we are uh, working uh, with your software, with Skiran and Sec3D and Map3D. We, for signal processing, we use LabVIEW. And we just embarked on a potential-based reconstruction without having 
assembled the entire electrogram. We just did an instantaneous <coughs> initial QRS analysis. Instead of epicardial surface, we were interested in endocardial surface because this is the target for the clinical uh, cardiac electrophysiology in more than 80% of cases. And we know that this particular arrhythmia is usually coming from the endocardial surface. And we have different number of electrodes, 120 according to the, uh, to the Dalhousie model. We used uh, the same electrode layout. The model that we created those days, I still was not uh, capable of uh, uh, doing any kind of se semi-automatic or automatic meshing, so I manually created uh, boundaries of epicardium and endocardium on the basis of CAT scan, just by acquiring point clouds and, and, and shuffling, shuffling them manually and, and connecting them with triangles. This was another very encouraging feature of, of, of the measurement we got that we actually analyzed potentials that seem to be before the QRS complex. In the, in the electrophysiology lab, the recipe for successful ablation of a focal arrhythmia like this is to find potentials that actually precede QRS complex. And this looks like we can, with quite a reasonable high resolution ECG, uh, tackle potentials that, uh, that basically are some 20 to 30 milliseconds before naked eye discernible uh, QRS complex. So we performed the boundary element inverse, uh, inverse solution that's available in SKIRAM. The modules are there, so we assembled the pipeline and created this uh, superimposition of that of the handmade model and reconstructed potentials. And we took the points, the mapping points from, from the Carto system and tried to match in space uh, whether the initial negativity that we believed should reflect the, the initial activity uh, with the site of the successful ablation and the match is like like this this, this is the initial minimum and this is the, uh, the site of successful ablation the red dot that is there the carto maps are again reconstructed manually so that we took out the points from the carto system and, and by hand created a triangularized surface Nevertheless, uh, the, the, this, the potential distributions were not trivial. We were getting multiple minima. So we don't know what, what this minimum means, whether it's noise, whether it's a consequence of the calculation or what it is. You all know the, the modules and the way uh, how to reconstruct the, the potentials in the boundary element method. Of course, we were not happy with the manual work, so we tried on, on the success, the su subsequent cases and, uh, and uh, cardiac images to, to develop some sort of at least sem semi-automatic meshing of the heart muscle, at least of the surfaces, as you can see here. The, the plane that, that, that is here, it's, it's actually uh, part of the segmentation from the from sec 3d so we somehow learned to to mesh the cardiac surfaces and the result was that that, that we could after all at the end to superimpose the maps that, that we uh, reconstructed on the real anatomical surfaces instead of the, instead of the handwork i was showing before so this was very encouraging so and, and cases like this, they don't come very often in terms of uh, being successful, having arrhythmia that's easy to handle, easy to map, having the patient that, uh, that would not have a very long procedure, so he would withstand the cardiac mapping during the procedure. 
easily. So we decided to speed up a little bit and, and went for a protocol that's called face mapping. Face mapping is something that's historically very well known uh, from from the 90s. This is the paper when, when this gentleman actually successfully on purely statistical basis was able to distinguish uh, numerous locations within within a endocardial surfaces of both ventricles, actually this is showing just the, the right ventricle, but, but we did uh, uh, the experiment in both ventricles and distinguished the locations on the basis of body surface maps. We use face mapping also in the laboratory on a routine basis in clinical cardiac EP. So, we could track the catheter where we could face from with the TARTO system so that we could acquire the facing points later. And we actually performed a registration of the TARTO points with the, with the CAT scan, with the, with the computer tomography, through registration through the aortic arch. It's a very stable technique when, when a physician would stick the catheter the arch, pull it back and acquire points in the CARTO system and then you can you can just fit those points into the into the aortic arch taken from the from the uh, computer tomography. And what we could see and what was quite uh, discouraging was that the points acquired from the ventricles did not match well with the uh, with the surfaces of the endocardial, on the endocardial surfaces uh, from the left and right ventricles. We, we do not know where is the source of this, of this mismatch. So there comes the question of registration to, to, to a great importance. Nevertheless, we analyzed the pacing data and in some cases we could see something that, that really corresponded, I mean, in spatial domain. Nevertheless, the, the images are not easy to understand. And this is uh, where I become quite frustrated with, uh, uh, with boundary element method and, and with the reconstruction of, of uh, uh, potentials in basically 2D space. When you look at the same surface from the other side, you again get multiple minima and maxima despite of using the L curve boundary element, uh, the T of regularization based on the boundary element. Also, on the edges of, of those surfaces, we were getting uh, additional, uh, additional kind of disruptions of, of the of the reconstructive potentials. So we are somehow uh, considering the boundary element method uh, not, not unreliable, but, but not easy to, to understand and carry on in a, in a systematic approach. So we were looking for, for other options of, of uh, uh, inverse ECG based on the finite element method, so, so we first have, had to learn how to segment more in detail our cardiac images. So we went through, through basically two stages, first using the, the, the semi-automatic algorithms that were confined to, to the ski run environment, and uh, later we, uh, with, with the help of Mike, Mike Stefan, we make quite a progress in, in much better machine of, of the cardiac images based on the uh, Biomesh 3D. We created uh, some simulation models and, and tried to just to get an impression how the uh, how endocardial activation and uh, how changes in, in the voltage-based forward solution would affect uh, the lead field or the, the distribution of the potentials. We also played with the with the bi-domain model, uh, which 
I think is a little bit beyond the scope of, of my talk today. It's, uh, it's quite a advanced, advanced uh, type of modeling. So based on this, we think that uh, if we are to carry on successfully, we maybe need to design a new system for ECG mapping and, and uh, inverse ECG. Because there are these inherent problems with uh, registration. Uh, the question is whether we should use high resolution ECG I think it very much depends whether we, be, we would be using potential-based or activation time-based uh, universe solutions. Uh, to what extent we should actually sample the field and to what extent the, the measurement device, the hardware, the, the equipment should be basically capable of automatic catheter localization, tracking, and of course the subsequent processing. But since these things uh, are uh, provided by the computer, this is, uh, this is basically not, not an issue of, of, uh, of the equipment, but rather of the software uh, capabilities. What should the ECG imaging device provide. So let's look back what, what, the, what the modern uh, clinical cardiac electrophysiology uh, demands. What, what, is, what are the needs for the future trials and, and experimental work? We need better patient safety. We need to shorten the procedures. We need better personal safety. We need to further decrease x-ray exposure and to shorten the procedures again. We need speed and accuracy and there should be speed and accuracy that would at least match the, the systems that are currently in use. We should address the needs of arrhythmias that, that are not easy to, to uh, ablate. So, Right ventricle outflow tachycardia is not the right candidate for ECG imaging in terms of uh, in terms of demonstrating the capabilities of, of new technology that, that it can, it can compete with uh, with uh, the uh, contemporary technologies. So the more difficult arrhythmias are arrhythmias based on so-called reentry on the circulating wavefront arrhythmias. Arrhythmias that come from, let's say, unfavorable locations, or whatever uh, meaning this has, typically in, for example, ventricular tachycardias, tachycardias that come from the epicardial surface are harder to, uh, to cure with ablations than the ones that come from endocardium. And there is a question of coexistence with, with existing technologies in the laboratories. Since those pose quite a demand on, on space and interference, they occupy some of the torso surface, like defibrillation patches, location pads, and general interference. So the such candidates arrhythmias could be uh, ventricular tachycardias that are a result of remote or previous uh, myocardial infarction. So nowadays we know that, that these are the challenge for electrophysiology. And these are often the reason why these patients require implantable defibrillators that we have to tackle several types of arrhythmias in a single patient with a risk of deteriorating into ventricular fibrillation and the electrophysiologist if he has if he is to be successful in terms of uh, for example reducing the occurrence of, of uh, 
of ventricular tachycardia, so inducing the shocks from, from the ventricular uh, he would have to tackle the several morphologies of ventricular tachycardia in a single patient, like, like in this case. So these are all morphologies taken from a single heart, single patient. There are also arrhythmias that can change their morphology during the course, during the single run of arrhythmias called pleomorphic arrhythmia that can switch the morphology, uh, in this case due to the, due to the premature ventricular beat. So what we need to do, either with a contemporary or some future equipment, is actually a two-stage process, at least a two-stage process. First, in terms of feasibility studies. So the studies, the experiments we did basically proved that some of those reconstructions or measures we did were actually not feasible. So we need those feasibility studies and, and they, in my opinion, relate to the problem of validation and verification in, in, in your field of uh, medical physics. Clinical cardiac EP and radio frequency ablation seems to be a good, good paradigm for testing this feasibility because we at least know where is the source that we are seeking for in vivo, in a real patient. These feasibility studies basically should be aimed at navigation and targeting accuracy, should use method, for example, of pace mapping and entrainment. Entrainment is a special technique that, that we use to, to prove that the arrhythmia has re-entry mechanism, that it has circulating wave from start to pace into the arrhythmia and reset it continuously, that's called entrainment. We should analyze whether the introduction of ECG imaging and inverse ECG would in fact improve time consumption of the procedure and not worsen it. And that's related of course to the, to the processing speed and computational algorithms. Ideally, we might try to prove that we can decrease catheter consumption, that we can maybe in a single procedure instead of three catheters would be good with just one or two. And optimally, of course, improved patient and healthcare uh, worker safety. And the second stage after, after proving this feasibility would be real clinical trials, it means in a particular set of patients with a, with a well-defined arrhythmia, comparing online, in vivo, that the technology is better than, than the contemporary uh, technology. So in my view, in conclusion, I would say that if we are to move forward in terms of these ECG analysis and change, the way we treat EKG and do something more than 12 feet EKG. We have to carry on ECG mapping and inverse electrocardiography. And we should do it in the setting of cardiac electrophysiology and in the first step use the radio frequency ablation as a paradigm or a good candidate at least for validation ver verification. Thank you. Thank you, Zit. Thank you, Peter. Questions? Yes, Ravi. Ravi's also a doctor, so he's allowed to ask questions. <laughs> that was a very nice presentation. Thank you. You showed a very nice example of how this in RDO TBT were able to calculate the recycle of the correlated role of the how far are we from using that to figure out what the 
think we are not very far from it because uh, we should be able in, in a very foreseeable future introduce a set of tools that are capable of reconstructing the field not only in terms of potential reconstructions but also in terms of uh, estimated activation times. And that might very much resemble to what you observe during the re and run uh, antiviral tachycardias on your electroanatomical mapping systems. So I'm saying foreseeable future, but I would rather say it is a matter of a well-designed study which would be a feasibility study. So and if, if you ask me whether we are ready for doing a feasibility study like that, I, I believe we are. Even if we did not have an equipment in a complete kind of fashion that, that, that I was uh, uh, actually uh, rather questioning whether, whether we really need it or not, because registration problems, they, they, they can be tackled by, by digital methods, by better mathematical methods. I think we are able to perform a feasibility study like this in a very near future, let's say, let's say within one year, in terms of uh, using a contemporary ECG mapping system. Uh, the question is very good because the target here would be exit site, which means something that's uh, that's uh, analogous to the to the focal arrhythmia, and of course the biggest interest would be to reconstruct the entire uh, re implant circuit and to see also the protective systems and entry point and so on. However, I, I, I understand that, that you realistically looking for the, for the exit point as a, as a target structure. Have you um, considered trying the system substrate like that? I personally did not do the recording. I, when I was working with uh, uh, Professor Horacek's team, he was mapping WPW syndrome, and he was getting matches, let's say, with the ablation results that were very similar to what we see. So I believe that in, in a pure case of ventricular pre-excitation with, with well delineated delta wave, uh, the results should be basically the same. And of course, it very much depends on, on, the, on the level of pre-excitation and on the level of competition with AV node production and, uh, or whether the accessory pathway would conduct uh, only backwards. So, so, of course, there will be limitations in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, various clinical entities because the WPW syndrome is a quite, sometimes of quite dynamic nature. So the delta wave can disappear and can, can basically change its magnitude. And also there are multiple accessory pathways that, uh, that can bring challenges to, to, the, to the very technology. So if you ask me whether I would perform the feasibility study on the WPW uh, patient population, I would rather start with the ventricular tachycardia patient because in those, I would have at least some level of certainty that they would have enough eccentric ventricular activation and, and, and the sequence of the ventricular activation would be more legible than in WPW patients. But WPW patients can be also mapped, for example, in, in, in so-called antidromic uh, tachycardia, which, which gives rise to a entirely Centric ventricular activation that, that basically behaves the same way as the as VT. So, so there are ways how to how to deal with difficult accessory pathways and how to potentially 
uh, take some advantage from the uh, from ECG of ECG guided navigation. Army. Yes, there are measures, either pharmacological or, or uh, based on, on pacing protocols that can, uh, that can change the conduction through the accessory pathway. This is quite advanced physiology, of course, but, uh, but it will be necessary for those feasibility studies, of course, to use all the, all the tools that we have in the clinical operation. Any more cardiologists in the room? <laughs> <laughs> so, any more questions? Maybe a complication? Yes. You mentioned trying to achieve or match the statistical accuracy. How would you characterize the statistical accuracy of chemistry? In terms of diagnostic performance, uh, I tried to put it forward during the talk. My impression is when I put together what we did on QT dispersion on post-MI patients, on uh, ischemia patients with, with uh, let's say, dynamic ischemia, that I would have something around 10% increased sensitivity if I do not sacrifice any specificity. There is a significant ROC curve, so if, if I want more, I start to sacrifice specificity. So the ROC curves for ECG mapping are not optimal. And you saw some of them with the transformation studies, and you saw that the less damage the heart had, the, the, the more blunt the curves were. Actually, we, we had to have a big Q waves to, to get good match between reconstructed EKG and, and measured EKG. So, so this would be my kind of simple general statement about 10% increase in a diagnostic power, in a, in a sensitivity, if I don't want to sacrifice any specificity. It, 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 it does not have much relevance to the ECG imaging itself, uh, the question you ask, because uh, it's rather a using a diagnostic criti criteria that are derived from ECG mapping as opposed to the criteria derived from, from 12 EKG or ALTER or whatever other clinical modality. If that, was, uh, if that satisfies uh, your, your question. Pardon me? What you can do. Yes, exactly. We can do one more question. So when you show the kind of confusing results of some of the inverse solutions to try, it seems like the problem was that you use a downrium instead of a Yes, yes. Because I would have guessed the problem was you using a taken off inverse on a potential based solution and I would have been a more electrophysiologically driven approach to the solution, or exaggeration based or something else. Yes. I have my favorites for the others. So I'm curious why you think it's downrium. Yes, uh, we, we chose boundary element method because it was simple. It was simple for me to understand in terms of uh, the algorithm that Skiran was offering. So I could easily assemble the, the pipeline. And as well, it was promising because the calculations were very fast. Actually, we were, we were capable of getting the endocardial solutions in, in, in pure processing time, in, in matters of tens of seconds or minutes, if I was using L curve, could it could be up to 10 minutes, depending on the number of nodes. So that the pure preference was this kind of practical. Why do you think that? that so, so my guess would be what feature results. Yeah. The, the issue was the way we do in the inverse solution, not which whether you use binary, binary, or binary. Well, I wonder, because uh, in finite element method, my impression is that I would not have to create closed surfaces, for example. So I had to artificially close the surfaces of the, of the, of the outflow tracts, for example, by putting a, a cap on it. And Skiran does not allow me to, to select whether some points uh, are electrically active or not. So my impression was that there were some disturbance 
created on those sharp closures uh, of the surfaces. And, and, and my impression from the finite element method is that I will not have to do this, because if I can represent myocardium as a closed volume with, uh, with rounded, let's say, edges or rounded uh, boundaries, then it might behave different, but, but this is beyond my capabilities. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that's it. Uh, you can put them down in down is on the binary. Yes, and, and I did. I did uh, you, you could see that there are uh, differences between those models, so I was playing with, with different ways. Well, I think there's a major advantage to find out. I guess it's the key issue there is whether you're going to be able Perhaps. If that is the case, it's optimistic, right? Because the, sure. there is some yeah. good solution. Yeah. Okay, we've probably gone well over time now, so thank you one more time. <laughs> and uh, better have it now, because. Uh,